the mayor sits down, and that will be 11. Right, we will reopen the meeting, and we welcome uh, Panuku, and Adrian, Roger, and Carl. It's all yours. The right, uh, yeah. Um, good afternoon, councillors, and thank you very much for the opportunity to come and present our third quarter uh, report to you. Uh, kia ora tato. Um, look, it's, um, uh, I have now uh, been chairing the Board of Panuku for just over uh, six months, and I thought it was opportune just to make a couple of observations uh, about some of the reshaping of governance. Um, we have um, a, we have a, a committee of the entire board. Uh, it was actually a specialist committee. Now it's the entire board, being the transformation committee, and we meet every uh, board meeting for two or three hours before the board meeting, uh, and essentially workshop and do deep dives into all of the unlock, transform, and support locations and into specific issues, which are um, occurring around the city. Uh, to ensure that the uh, investment and trust that the council has placed in the board is well rewarded by expert and detailed knowledge um, of all the projects we are carrying out on your behalf. Um, we have um, we've also uh, been every second board meeting. We're now moving our board's uh, meetings around the region. Uh, we most recently had a board meeting at Monaco, and we uh, took the opportunity not only to um, look at the Monaco City Centre, which is one of the transform locations, uh, we also um, had lunch with the two local boards. Uh, we thought we might get a showing of um, chairs. Um, in fact, we had about uh, 12 board members uh, come from the local boards, and we had a fantastic conversation uh, just to understand the issues from their perspective um, and to make sure that the work that we're doing is well stitched in with their uh, local board plans uh, and the issues as they see them. Um, of course, we can't, aren't, we can't um, address all issues, but it's helpful for us to actually understand that. So we have also been doing uh, very extensive site visits um, to, to uh, proceed some of the approval of high-level project plans. The most recent one was a visit to Pukekohe. Uh, most of the board members uh, took half a day uh, to go to Pukekohe, either um, as a group or individually, um, walk, walk around, uh, meet local board um, chairs, uh, le uh, meet leaders of Ngāri Tiata, uh, and just make sure that you know, we sort of um, really can look and feel and um, pace the streets. Uh, and I would have to say that Pukekohe is a very uh, exciting proposition. Um, one of the uh, best um, medium-sized towns um, in the region. It's not all about um, the city. So the, um, the board is extremely engaged. You will also be aware that uh, there is normal rotation coming up uh, of board members without going into any of those processes. Um, I would comment that we've had an extremely high calibre of people put themselves forward for the Panuku board, um, and that I think says an awful lot uh, about Auckland Council and the direction and what it's doing. Uh, I can't let this, um, these opening comments go without congratulating the council on uh, declaring a climate emergency. Now, we have to think pretty deeply about what that means. Um, in terms of Panuku, but of course we are we already know we are doing the right things and that we're looking at regenerating town centres uh, on behalf of the people of Auckland and basically creating town centres um, in these focused locations which provide a lot of opportunities for closer living but also much more exciting and livable um, and rich town centres where you can do an awful lot um, through basically just really pretty much outside your door. Um, you know, it's interesting to note that uh, over the last year, um, e-bike sales have gone crazy. People are now biking uh, 15 kilometres easily one way. Within 15 kilometres, transform and unlock locations we're already working on uh, for the council include Pamuir, include Northcote, when we get Skypath. Um, they um, also include Onehanga. Um, and um, I'm sure I've missed um, a couple there. Oh, the town centre itself, of course, with Wynyard. Um, so there are already a number of locations, and you add that to the Crown's um, um, locations as well. There's, there's actually an awful lot going on to make the city um, sort of a lot less uh, carbon intense um, and enable people to use public transport, walking and biking as a way to seriously get around. Mm. 
Um, turning just briefly then to Māori outcomes, uh, the board is paying a lot of focus really to how we can deepen this relationship, particularly around commercial outcomes. So we have 19 um, iwi that we, um, through council, um, have a treaty relationship with. Um, they are all eager one way or another to get involved with the development of the city. Um, and we are starting to think, well, how can we really make this happen? This is not actually a five minute journey. Um, so we are uh, looking at our pipeline and we're talking very actively um, with uh, a number of parties as to how we can make opportunities available which are doable for them. Um, and so this is not going to be something that happens uh, overnight. And of course, there's a um, very large um, uh, a process out there with respect to the Crown and RFR processes. Um, I, I would just also like to point out that um, you've, there has been a lot of focus from the Council on uh, the capital spend uh, of Pānuku. Of course, the capital spend is to support the transformation of the, the various town centres. Um, you have, uh, we have been significantly increasing our capacity to actually deliver capital projects. Um, last, year, last financial year, uh, we completed 22 million. Uh, this financial year, we will be tripling that to about 74 million. Um, and next year, well over 100 million. We have put in significant additional capacity to be able to deliver uh, on those projects. Uh, but we will never deliver projects um, which, with the benefit of getting a long way down the process, do not make sense from a value for money or timing perspective. Um, but nevertheless, uh, there is a requirement uh, for us to basically deliver those projects um, which enable the transformation. Um, I've got with me Roger MacDonald uh, and Carl Cosby who are going to go through the financial and practical results. The financial um, results for the end of the third quarter are positive for Panuku. We're showing a, uh, a net $3 million variance, a majority of which, sorry, um, 1.7 of which is forecast to be retained by the end of the year, and that's relating to additional income that we weren't anticipating. Um, so that's pretty much a good news story. We are expecting our operational expenditure to catch up to budget, but not exceed. Um, on the next slide, if we could, Roger. Um, <clears throat> The um, commercial portfolio we operate within Council is also showing a 2.4 million variance, which is positive against budget. And again, this is due to increased income um, and the operating expenditure is expected to be retained within budget by the end of the year, thus guaranteeing that uh, positive variance throughout to the end of the year. Um, sorry, if we can flip, off, flip on to the next one. We can have a quick look at the capital spend. Um, Capital spend year to date, we're looking at 35.9 million at the end of um, March. We are uh, with a capital forecast that we reported to you at the last quarter of 74 million. I'm pleased to report we're still on track to be there. At the end of May, we actually had a capital spend up to 55 million, with 15 million of that being delivered in May. What we're seeing is the natural response to the um, projects being put into um, contract and delivery proceeding, and we're going to see the ski ramp at the end of the year as we move into that delivery phase. Um, if we move on to the next slide, please, Roger. I think the um, uh, performance measures that we have in the papers before you, um, we've pulled out those which are uh, measurable in the part year and not only measurable at the end of the year. Pleased to say they're all met with the exception of one, which is our Transform and Unlock Location initiatives. Um, we're forecasting this not to be met, even though we're partway through the year. There's a very small um, margin of error on this between nearly met and not met of 2%. There's only 14 targets. It takes one of those to be off, and we're not going to meet. Um, however, we're currently forecasting that three are off. Um, the areas relating to uh, Papatoitoi, um, particularly uh, Tavern Lane development delay, which you'll probably be aware of. Um, in Northcote, we're behind our target. We were trying to facilitate crown requests during the year, which have held us back. And you'll all be aware of the citizen, City Centre CAB project, which was delayed. So from that performance, I think if I hand to Roger, he can give the highlights for neighbourhoods. <coughs> Tanakota, Tanakota, Katil. 
Um, I'd like to just focus on a number of the highlights across our program um, on America's Cup. Um, delighted to report that we're on track in terms of the wider initiatives, um, that the host venue agreement has been completed, and that incorporates the super yacht agreement as well. Uh, our main role now is to focus working with the council-wide family, that's with the TEED, with ACE and with the syndicates, in order to make sure that we have a great event. Moving on to Northcote, this is the regeneration of the shopping centre. Uh, public works acts are progressing well with regard to the acquisitions. The town centre benchmark master plan has now been published in April. Initial responses have been very positive. Local board has endorsed the master plan, uh, which is great news, and it's been very well supported throughout. The next steps now is working with the councillors uh, so that we can work through uh, for the next part of the, the exciting story. <clears throat> On Takapuna, this is a much-loved holiday park, um, and we're going through now a process of upgrade in terms of improving that space. The proposed new owners are Stephen and Jeanette Edwards. The couple also own and run 10 holiday parks in Queenstown, Nelson, Fox Glacier, and Motoria. Their vision is very much to create a place for Aucklanders and visitors to Takapuna. The proposed design reimagines the campground in a modern way that will make it an asset for the community for the next 30 years. <coughs> Give you an update briefly on MIT. Uh, this, in the last quarter, we've been running through a procurement process to establish a new facility at 52 and 54 Manukau Station Road. This will provide a new technology hub, a place to accommodate 1,200 students and 200 staff. The resource consent has now been issued, which is great news, and construction will be commencing shortly. On Hamaru, 21 Henderson Valley Road sites, um, we've had a few challenges with that one. We entered into a conditional contract with the developer for housing. The developer was actively working alongside KiwiBuild until November of last year, and the reason for that was to secure the underwrite against the programme. In April 2019, Kiwi Bill determined they would not proceed with this underwrite, and we're now looking at the best ways that we can take that back to the market, obviously reflecting the current conditions. Green State Court, a strategic partnership negotiation is progressing with the Housing New Zealand Corporation, and this will enable the redevelopment into a new village that will provide a minimum of 28 units, which will be affordable and for the older community. That's progressing well. Moving over to West Haven, uh, the design concept has now been completed. Uh, the ECI contractor evaluations have been completed, and we anticipate that contractor being awarded very shortly. We're working now into the detailed design for the proposal and also the leasing campaign to undertake some of the commercial risk. Moving across to Pukakawi, we are working through the high-level project plan uh, with the local board. We've identified a number of development opportunities to strengthen the local community and obviously bringing those communities along with us in terms of a partnership. We're also piloting an exemplar partnership with Manafenua and the Franklin local, local Board has endorsed our high-level project plan and that's obviously went to the planning committee for approval yesterday. Moving over to the airfield site, uh, Hobsonville Point is a greenfield community proposal led by HLC. Obviously, we own, as part of the council family, 20 hectares of land. Uh, Avanda are progressing uh, with construction of the first phase, and there's physical construction work now on site for that residential part. And we're working closely with HLC to optimise the employment zone, obviously acknowledging the fact the market is challenging at the moment, uh, but considering various options and routes to market. Under some of the business, well, this moves forward, some of the business achievements, um, 35 Graham Street was a conditional contract uh, for the sum of 58 million, which was progressing through the last quarter, following the marketing campaign we undertook in February. I'm delighted to advise now the sale has gone unconditional and the purchase is now is following through uh, with the commitments under that condition. This will provide a great repurposed opportunity um, for the city to benefit from. Moving over to the cab building, I'm delighted to report 
that this agreement has now been settled with Civic Lane, Authority, Civic Lane Limited, and this will provide new homes and new community in a wonderful location close to all the local amenities. It will provide a boost for the economy and for future residents next to great transport, jobs and shop opportunities. Weapons. Sometimes it goes across, sometimes it doesn't. <clears throat> um, thought it'd be useful just giving you a bit of an update working with the central government. Uh, we continue to work closely with central government across our priority locations. In Manukau, a large site has been sold for the expansion of the MIT campus which is critically important to uh, the regeneration of the area. There are several properties also in the discussion in Henderson, Papatowatowi, Flatbush and Avondale as all part of our precinct plan developments. We're working with the Housing New Zealand, Kiwi Build and HLC and this is part of the future proposed Kayanga Aura Homes and Communities. Regular meetings are being held with Kiwi Build and continually looking at opportunities that we can progress through our pipeline. We're exploring the concept of an umbrella agreement between the Crown entities and Paducah will inform how we work collaboratively across our locations. The formation of Kayanga Aura Homes and Communities creates an opportunity for us to align our programme and deliver effectively and more efficiently. We anticipate working together on precinct development planning side by side across our neighbourhoods and partnering to deliver joint outcomes. Bit of an update on uh, Manifena engagement. The Council Group Programme for Achieving Improved Outcomes for Maori is Te Takanini. Uh, following the adopted strategic priorities, um, we've achieved through the Kai Tiangi Forum uh, the Unlock North Code Opportunity, uh, the Greenway Opportunity, Manukau Punui Stream, and the West Haven Palm Mooring Programmes. So all of those programmes benefit from commercial benefits to Manifena. Under employment, we're being offered regular opportunities through the AC36 infrastructure build. We're also increasing the number of Maori staff employed by Panuku. We're regularly supporting Maori businesses by catering provisions, provision of native plants, maintenance work, Maori consulting, artists and technical specialists to support that wider manafenor engagement. We're also realising employment potential through a pilot project that supports the youth in being extended to work with AC36 and ultimately across our wider programme. Under the Maori identity and culture, this quarter is progressing with a number of significant art and design opportunities for Manafenua to give effect to gifted cultural narrative. The Park Hyatt Poe uh, carvings are really an important piece of that. There will be uh, four Poe actually delivered in readiness for the opening of uh, the Park Hyatt Hotel. The Takapuna car park design, the promenade projects, the Open Upi playground and the Anahunga mural are naming but a few opportunities we're working through. Under effective Maori participation, we're co-designing partnership strategies with Manafenua for Anahunga Wharf and Iron Lock programmes. <clears throat> I'd just like to just pick up uh, the issue on environmental sustainability because it's something that one I'm very passionate about and an organisation we're fully engaged on. We're working closely with our developers to advance Homestar, our low carbon residential tool. And as many of you will be aware, we're targeting Homestar 7 in Wynyard and Homestar 6 in our other locations. We've engaged with the CCOs, industry, government and developers to create a low carbon framework for the new commercial buildings. We're about to pilot this on three projects, including one that Panuka will deliver directly. We're now using the learnings to inform a low-carbon framework for public realm across our programmes. Panuku has advanced two Green Star community projects, compiling evidence for projects in Henderson and Takapuna. This has included developing approaches to greenhouse gas modelling and climate resilience. We provided significant input into adapting Green Star for New Zealand, which will benefit community projects well beyond Panuku and well beyond Auckland. Panuku has played a key part in supporting the emerging Auckland Climate Action Plan that was referenced earlier by our chair, and we're contributing to zero emissions in the city centre and progressing blue-green infrastructure in Manukau. Panuku is also leveraging its membership of the C40 
to drive low carbon initiatives in several locations, including Henderson. This includes the reinviting, sorry, this includes innovative reinvestment cities, proposal in Henderson, and behaviour research to support fossil fuel free streets in the Wynyard Quarter. Panuku continues to progress climate control responses working across council. And my last piece here is really just giving a bit of an update on local board engagement. We continue to engage with local boards on optimisation opportunities and asset sales and overall programme. Council approved the Pukakoe as an additional location to our priority location programme in November 2018. We've produced our high-level project plan and we've completed following engagement with the Franklin Local Board who endorsed the plan in April this year. A joint political reference group was established to explore issues on de-investment of council assets. This is a council-led initiative which is supported by Panuku. A report in March 2019 to the Joint Governance Political Working Party sets out recommendations for improvement to the divestment processes and policies will inform programme moving forward. Local board and councillor interactions in this quarter has included more than 40 workshops or meetings to consider proposals for rationalisation, optimisation, programme improvements and information sharing. Work has commenced internally with local boards to provide local board members information packs, induction packs, outlining Panuku's activity across the city post-election. Thank you very much. Questions? <laughs> I did pick it up myself. Thank you. We'll go get a more culturally appropriate photo <laughs> next time. Sorry, my speaker's not on. It's election year that um, it's going to be a bit awkward over the next few months, but strongly recommend you continue getting around all the local boards that have transformed or unlock or even support when you've got time support programs um, because it's an important part. Um, I'm going to ask the first question just and, uh, on your on our papers on um, page 60. Your issues risks uh, are effectively all been highlighted by some previous parties which is delays to the A36 works uh, evolving uh, very nicely worded evolving Crown relationships and partnerships. Um, and then challenging market conditions. So I'll just point out to you that um, those have all been highlighted previously and we had a fairly extensive um, presentation from Barry Potter about 8.36. So I have Councillor Philippine, uh, Councillor Simpson, Councillor Casey. Tēnāko uh, katoa. And look, um, I've got a question and a request. Uh, the question is based on the slides 10, 12, and that was in relation to working with central government and local board engagement. Um, so look, with the MIT Tech Hub, and, and knowing uh, from my understanding is that um, some of the land and buildings in Otara, which are currently occupied by uh, MIT, will be up for either redevelopment. Are we around that table? Uh, in regards to that. I know it's central government land, but are we around that table? That's one of the key um, key things. So that's the first question. Um, the short answer is that no, Panuku is not around the table, but we are aware um, that, that, because that has been discussed a lot as part of the Transform <laughs> Monaco um, initiative, uh, and there is, uh, and we, we do know that Crown agencies are talking with each other um, between um, the uh, emerging Kainga Ora um, and also uh, the uh, Crown Land Programme and MIT. So we know those discussions are underway, but we're not party to them. As a result of, of, of the area, um, would it be a, 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 a case where possibly His Worship the Mayor along with yourself as chair and CEO, end up at least putting that request through to the government because with the two sites, they they are going to be integral in, in, in regards to what we want to do in Otara. So that's just another question. 
I think it will be very timely, particularly uh, bearing in mind um, the, the um, Otara Town Centre and the relationship with the, MI with the MIT site. Um, so I think that there's... Um, uh, I know from uh, Housing New Zealand that, that uh, Otara is not yet um, a... Uh, a transform location from the state housing perspective, um, but of course those discussions must be about to start in the next year or two. And uh, just just to request, I mean, local board engagement, fine. Um, having the workshops, fine. But I think in regards to specific locations, can I request that um, uh, the engagement that both myself and Councillor Collins, I have no doubt at all across the region, that that continues. Um, and I know that Helga's moved on to um, Onihanga um, and that area, and we've got Jody here, and I know that both myself and Councillor Collins have uh, met with Jody. But look, I have found those sessions um, very good in regards to Papa Tsui Tsui, the issues that were raised there, Transform Monaco. So that the request is please. Um, Please let those continue, and, 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 and let's not just rely on workshops because, you know, it, 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 you, you just tend to lose it. So, and, and please take it back to, to um, the respective uh, manager for both Jody, and, and Helga and say thank you on behalf of myself and Councillor Collins. Thank you, Councillor, uh, and we'll take on board that comment. Yes, please. I mean, certainly, it's something we are really, really passionate about in terms of getting the right outcomes. Thank you. And, uh, and I think um, a theme coming through there also is make sure you invite the local councillors when you have those local board interactions, because we often get left out um, of things. Councillor Simpson. My mind, don't you, Mr Chairman? I was just going to mention that. Um, hey, look, congratulations, and thank you for moving around, and I was going to make that same point that Councillor Chloe made. Look, I, um, I'm just going to ask you two questions, and actually, funnily enough, neither of them are financial. One is... Um, You've got a number of targets. You, you have an annual target, not a quarterly target. So the report's full of not applicable because it's, you know, what do people think about, what do people think about, you know. That final target is going to happen at a very interesting time politically. So my question to you around that is what feeling do you have that those targets, um, those annual targets will be met in those areas of public perception of you're doing a good job? Because I think that's really key. You're us, you know. Um, and we're very keen to keep our public perception higher. So what, what perception do you have that that will be a favourable on-target result for the quarter? And that's my first question. And my second question, um, Roger, what keeps you awake at night? What, what do you think is the thing that's concerning you the most about what you do? Um, and because a problem shared is a problem halved. Yeah, I think in terms of um, our reputation, which I think is what this ultimately goes down to, um, we obviously face challenges in all the areas that we operate in. Uh, in terms of raising our profile, we are working extensively on that with the local boards, with the Mana Whenua, uh, with the local communities, the business communities. And part of our drive moving forward is to get a lot more engagement around that piece so that ultimately we will improve the score rating that we do on our KPIs. In terms of our overall KPIs, we are confident that those stipulated in the SOI, we will achieve all but one. That's right, yeah, and we're confident we'll get a good percentage of those, but it will not be sufficient in order to get that full point. <clears throat> On the issue of what's keeping me awake at night, um, I think it's probably fair to say we have to keep a very, very careful watch on the prevailing market because we are seeing development agreements falling through. And, and that is a product of obviously increasing construction costs. And it's a product of uh, just the market forces that we operate in today. So, you know, that is an issue. It's a continuing issue. And it will continue to be an issue for us as we move forward into this next year. Um, I think equally, we use it to our benefit. And we'll have to look at how we could potentially uh, reprioritize land and maybe come up with different solutions rather than necessarily seeking the full dollar. Because ultimately, we want outcomes. Councillor Casey. What happened to Kiwi Build in Henderson? I was going to ask that myself. 
Just generally, rather than Henderson, I'll pass that uh, over to the Chief Executive. Um, there is a, uh, there's a very significant um, review of making sure that all the agreements that KiwiBuild mm. enters into um, really match the market. Because at the end of the day, the actual purchase of KiwiBuild homes is done by first home buyers. Um, and so the Kiwi Build unit are, are are just being um, putting a very um, you know they that they that they're being very careful that they're actually investing in the right places mm. with the right with exactly the right kind of uh, product um, because the underwrite of course is an underwrite it's not supposed to be a purchase. And so that's generally what's happening with the Kiwi Build unit um, right around the country, uh, not just Auckland. They're looking very, very carefully at every single proposal. I think just to give you some feedback on Henderson, Henderson was one of the locations, it was one of five locations we were negotiating with Kiwi Build for the right outcomes. Um, they've gone through some significant change over the course of the last 12 months. And what we've seen now is that their own land holdings through the Crown is obviously something that's critical to them to get the right outcomes. And um, I think the prioritisation of that has unfortunately affected us in a number of locations, and it's not just in Henderson. We've also seen the same situation arriving in, in um, Avondale as well. I don't quite get it. I, I think if, if I'm being candid as a developer, I think the challenge is when you do a residual valuation and you take away your cost of construction, the cost of the infrastructure, um, what's actually left is very little. And I think that's where the real challenge lies. You know, we've got to find a way embracing different methods of construction to bring the cost down so that we can start to deliver more affordable homes. So going back to the Henderson site, is that going back out to the market? We're reviewing that at the moment, uh, but our intention is that we will go back to the market. And to be fair, before Kiwi Bill came on board, we did have a buyer for that site. And then with the opportunity to leverage Kiwi Build, uh, the developer wanted to get a 50% and then potentially more out of the Kiwi Build product. The challenge they were facing is as a developer, if you're building two phases and one phase is a Kiwi Build product and the second phase is an identical product, it's difficult then to have a different price point. And I think that was one of the challenges. Mm. Meg off. My, oh, sorry, I had two oh, questions. Sorry. The second question you might not allow, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, at the Community Development and Safety Committee, we had the disability panel present on the subject. The whole, the whole committee was devoted to um, accessibility and accessible housing and universal design. And I just wondered if what, it's, it's not a word that appears anywhere in your report, that's why I'm probably going to disallow it, but I'm interested in how you would be pursuing that as of, you know, making housing more accessible. Um, extremely timely. Uh, we are in the process of uh, developing as just as an adjunct to our um, housing policy and accessibility pos po uh, policy, which is really will back itself into development agreements. So this is to look at universal um, access um, for, for so to to look at the extent to which we can so it, it will happen um, and it will it's just really a matter of um, how far it will it will go and what the mix might actually be uh, but it's a work a piece of work just un, underway right now. Forward to bringing the results of that back here. That's great news. Thank you. Councillors, be aware that we're sitting on 12 members at the moment, so when one person goes, we can't have another person go. So please, if you wish to go to the toilet or something, please check around on the numbers before you do, or to answer your phone. Meg off. Uh, thank you. Just uh, two unrelated questions. The first with uh, Homaru and Henderson Valley Road. When does that open? It's scheduled to be later on this year, Your Honour. Yeah. How, uh, it's, how much it's later? Well, it's currently at roof level. Yeah. Um, I, if I would estimate now, it's probably around November time I would see that being finished. Yep. Uh, but I can come back and confirm that categorically. And Greenslade Court? Um, I'll have to come back on that one, I'm not sure. Okay. To That's be fine. Um, my, my main question was in relation to environmental sustainability, and it's great that we've declared a, a, a climate change emergency, but 
actually what will be judged on is what we do, not what we declare. And what I was wanting from you is um, your thoughts in, in your particular areas of endeavour uh, as to what the most important things we need to do um, to keep our, our um, global emissions at a level that is consistent with a 1.5% uh, um, uh, temperature rise. I know that most of your projects, I think, are Green Star 5 or 6, is that correct? It's Home Star 6 Home Star. and Good. Home Star 7 on the waterfront. Uh, that, is that the same as gr the Green Star rating, though? No, the Green Star rating is actually for a community. Yeah. So we have a different rating system for communities, and we're also proposing to introduce a new rating system for commercial buildings. So Home, home Star 5 is what you're aiming at, or 6? No, so Home Star 6 across all our portfolio. OK, and, and what does, how, how does that equate to the Green Star ratings? Is that excellent? Is that uh, best practice or is it below that? It's a slightly different um, set of sequences because one is around a building and mm. one is around a community. Yeah. So with the Home Star 7, uh, we're really well above building codes. We're getting well insulated homes, we're getting double glazing, we're getting thermal insulation in the units uh, and grading that back every time you step back. Obviously, the amount of insulation, the amount of benefits starts to diminish as you go straight back to the code. OK. So if I just take it to the broader question, what are, what are the most important things that you could do to contribute towards reducing um, uh, carbon emissions? Um, uh, Mayor, I think that um, these, I think, are really fundamental questions for the city. Um, and, uh, and I know you've had a lot, lot of discussion, but actually city form, um, embedded, ca uh, embedded carbon and really in our lifestyle, mm -hmm. Um, is a huge issue, and I think at, at the um, outset I mentioned just this, the the existence of the Auckland plan and, in particular, the work of Panuku and uh, Auckland Transport around trying to get much density done well, a lot more medium density, close to transport links where people can live much lower carbon lives. Mm -hmm. just through um, being able to actually access so many of the things, schools, employment, um, parks, all those things within walking and biking distance is really is a really, really important part of the future. This is a strategic conversation that I'm sure you're having um, around this table. Um, we're up for anything that you tell us, whether it mm -hmm. is to go faster, whether it is to go higher or denser, whether it is to work more with Auckland Transport um, to make sure that every single transport investment takes with it a transit orientated development so we get higher efficiency. These are all the things that we understand and we will be very willing partners uh, to the council strategy around this. Yeah. Is it, um, I agree with the point about making a more compact city. That's one of the most important things that we can do. But do you have um, uh, any ability to quantify what a more compact city does to lower carbon emissions and lighten the carbon footprint that we leave. Have you done any studies in, or are you familiar with any studies in this area? I'm certainly not familiar with studies here in New Zealand, um, but certainly the UK where you've got excellent transport facilities, it significantly reduces the carbon footprint, uh, providing two things happen. One is that you embrace modern methods of construction because one of the biggest areas is around waste. So mm -hmm. in the construction process, there's a big piece around that. Mm -hmm. And secondly, it's behaviour for the occupants. So it's encouraging people to think about recycling. It's encouraging people to use green travel plans, not to take out the car, preferably not to even buy a car. Mm -hmm. and, and because that's part of the whole package. If you think green and you behave green, you will have a significant impact on that footprint. Mm. Um, finally, Mr Chair, I think you know, what we'd encourage you to do is to come back to us with, with plans, um, obviously indicating the sort of impact we can make through the sort of things that you mm. are doing and what yeah. other options mm. you have in front of us, yeah. uh, in front of you. Um, it may be that they are more expensive, um, but we, we're also conscious that there will be a cost to applying to yeah. not reducing those carbon emissions. So we, we will need to make judgments, particularly by the time we get to the long-term plan uh, year after next. Thank you. I agree. And on that point, <clears throat> you know, as an organisation, there are things that can be done that are relatively cheap to put in place. 
Um, we're looking at the moment at reducing our landfill waste as an organisation by 20% by 2019. So it's the small steps that, uh, that contribute. 2019? Yes, 2019. Right, councillors, I have two more. Uh, two more, uh, which is Councillor Walker. I'll just make a, a very quick um, observation, just following on from the Mayor. There was a colossal amount of work done during the Low Carbon Action Plan with a considerable number of reports around retrofitting the commercial um, stock in Auckland and also the residential stock, and there are reports um, on that that quantify stuff and certainly great work that's been done in cities like Adelaide. But I've, I've got a couple of um, questions. Uh, the, the first one is, it's, it's a question, but it's around an issue that goes to divestment and uh, instances where uh, property has been bought to us by um, Panuku, and instances, and I can cover off a number of examples, but I won't, where there are significant problems because the party that may be um, putting up that property, it could be open transport, it could be another part of um, council, uh, may not have done their homework, uh, may not be familiar with um, issues, and sometimes those issues are um, significant. There's one that I'm dealing with um, that goes to open transport right now that involves um, significant hazards um, associated with the divestment of um, properties along a, um, a road, um, for example. Um, and this is not a fault directly of um, Panuku. Panuku is only as good as the information that these other parties are bringing to it. But what I am suggesting is that we need a, a better facility for um, checking things, because otherwise Panuku gets embroiled in instances where the community becomes um, particularly um, concerned um, there are issues that sometimes go to consultation and the, um, and, and, and the lack of it. So I make the observation that we could be doing a lot better there. Um, the other issue that I just want to bring to your attention is, is around sustainability and, and carbon. It's the sunk carbon in um, projects. It's the um, opportunities that are available, one of which um, that I'm certainly concerned about is the Dockland Tram, where we have been told about the reduction in um, emissions from that um, project, and there are issues in terms of Panuku's ability to um, assist in expediting it as it goes to the Tefero Bridge and, and other aspects. Um, is there a question there, Councillor? Uh, so I'm not going to raise that so much as a, as a question, just put it on the table. Um, the other issue that I would raise that I've certainly seen that other cities do, um, particularly where they're doing exemplar work in the sustainability and the low carbon area, is the entity, and in this case it's Panuku, actually becomes absolutely transparent in terms of the costings and a whole range of things, so that somebody in the commercial sector can go and see not only what's done, but observe the breakdown so that the project becomes a true exemplar. And I could give you examples of other cities that do that. So I would suggest that. Um, I could ask that by way of a question, but I'm really just putting it on the, on the table as a challenge. Yep, and that's been noted and there is nodding. Uh, thank you, Councillor Walker. Councillor Hills. No. All right, um, I'm just gonna make a comment and I, not going to take it too far, but I'm more than aware that when you buy commercial property, you know, or a property that, that, that has, is going to be demolished at some stage in the future, that you, um, you always ensure that the tenants are left on, uh, can stay there on a month-by-month -month basis because you want to actually maximise the rental returns and revenue that comes in. All I was just give you a heads up, and I think you know what I'm talking about, where you've got something where there may be a community facility on that site and it is not necessary for it to be shut down immediately. Um, I would suggest you, just going forward, that you please be sensitive and ensure the same thing is offered to those community groups, sports groups or whatever, that it can go on on a month by month basis until you need it because we have an example, as you know, and it's led to death threats against a senior councillor here 
and caused one tremendous amount of angst um, amongst councillors and yeah, etc. So I'm going to say no more, and I think you know what I'm talking about, and uh, I believe it's been passed on to you by David Rankin and uh, Marion, etc., etc. So, all right, thank you very much for attending. Much appreciated. Right. Okay. Eighteen. We have eighteen, and this should be short because they were here yesterday for several hours. We can make up time. Right, we have Mark and we have Jackie and Nick. Yes. Kia ora. Um, you're, you're passing over to me, Mr Chair? Yes. Yep. OK, Mark's just said to me, you go, I'll be quick, you be quick, and um, I'll, you'll jump in, as will Jackie. Um, so what I'm going to do is just briefly highlight three uh, events or three deliverables from AT in the quarter three, uh, then talk briefly about uh, the money and our where we are against our KPIs, and lastly highlight a couple of uh, areas that we're looking to deliver over this current quarter and, and give you a heads up on those. Um, before I jump into the, into the presentation, um, it is worth just saying, particularly in light of the uh, meeting yesterday when we talked about screen attraction, that we, in our presentation, we're not, we don't talk at all about our work on investment attraction and that's partly because a lot of that stuff is is confidential until well after the fact. And um, actually, a lot of what we are doing at the moment is a lot of resource dedicated to uh, investment attraction, particularly in the film area. But also, uh, you will have read in the media in the last week or so about Costco, about the Cathlon. Um, these are companies that we actually spend a lot of time and a lot of lead-up work in helping them attract them to come to Auckland, providing with data, introductions and relationships. So that's an important part of what we do, but it's not covered in, in this presentation. Uh, the Lantern Festival occurred in the quarter. We've talked about this previously. It's a really uh, significant uh, event for Auckland amongst our cultural festivals. The numbers were slightly down on the previous year, but still 170,000 odd uh, visitors to the festival. A couple of things to highlight with the festival this year that are new or developments. One is we are very focused around developing sustainability as part of the way the festivals are run. 62% of the waste from the festival was, de was dealt with without going to landfill. This is this has doubled uh, the 34% that happened the previous year. So we are very focused around running these festivals in a way that improves um, sustainability. The second thing to flag with the festival that's worth noting, and that is um, we also at the same time launched a WeChat application for Chinese visitors to Auckland, which connects them into local Chinese people. And this is something that um, has been really well um, uh, welcomed by the, the Chinese community and is certainly an evidence of us moving into the whole uh, online digital space and linking stuff into the festival itself. So Lantern Festival was a big deliverable. Uh, the Go With Tourism campaign, which I know we've talked about previously here, 165 employers have um, registered as part of this. Uh, it, it's part of the destination strategy. It's about positioning the, the, the uh, visitor economy and tourism as a, an important career option for young people. It's been very much seen traditionally as a low quality option. It's seen as an extension of HOSPO. In fact, the industry is anything but just HOSPO. It's about business, it's about um, service, it's about um, investment and you know, attracting talent to the industry is uh, you know, a huge challenge and something we're working with the sector in Auckland on doing, and this campaign has been wel welcomed by the industry. 
Uh, also, the government itself is, is now looking at whether or not it picks up this as a national campaign and would allow us to step back a little bit. So, uh, important deliverable in the last quarter. And tripartite, uh, which is finished about a month ago. Not, again, don't want to say too much, um, other than to highlight the fact that while the, you had the deputy mayor uh, from LA here, the party secretary from Guangzhou, to the world's largest cities, China and the US, with delegations talking about business and trade, while the national governments were are in a trade war, whether it's you know with Donald Trump and Xi Jinping, and important point to highlight here is how the city-to-city -city relationships are not the same as government-to-government -government relationships, and indeed we have talked uh, quite often with MFAT in the last 12 months about the, the importance of broadening and deepening relationships between, uh, between the US, between uh, China, and the role that, that Auckland uh, as a city can play in that. So again, the tripartite was... Um, uh, you know, against all the measures we, we set for ourselves has been very successful. Um, I also just wanted to highlight um, one aspect that was particularly successful, and that is the, uh, the um, Fairiki Māori Business Network. One of the sessions we had uh, that was enormously um, successful and commented on, particularly by the LA delegation, was uh, the Māori, uh, meeting the Māori businesses and talking about their, their experiences in Auckland. Um, the reason I mention this is because quite often when we do talk about Māori outcomes, we do it in a way that somehow this stuff doesn't come through. It's dealt with as an add-on and to some degree through things like Te Ta Tua Takatini, whereas in fact the tripartite, this was a central feature involving Māori businesses and was a successful part of the, the event. So it, it reflects ATED's commitment to supporting Māori business um, in, in fundamental core uh, ways is what we do in terms of what we do as an organisation. So those sort of three big things that um, uh, used a lot of our time and effort in, in quarter three. Uh, coming on to our financial performance, um, Probably the key point to highlight here is we are running at the end of March about some five million uh, behind our budget. Uh, sitting at, towards the end of June today, I can tell you we'll probably end up the final financial year close to, if not slightly behind, our total budget. The reason we are behind the the, the forecast as of uh, thirty. March is we actually went through some major changes in the organisations at the beginning of the financial year, which slowed down activity, but we've caught up much of that um, as we reach the end of the financial, or will end up, end up at the end of the financial year. Uh, one thing we will end up having to defer, and this has been worked through with um, the uh, um, mana whenua, is deferring the um, Haringa Waka festival, which has been affected by uh, Team New Zealand, Emirates Team New Zealand moving into the uh, event centre down on and down at the viaduct. Um, and we work, are working through with Mana Whenua and the Kaitiaki Forum uh, how that festival will be um, managed in the future. And, you know, we're quite comfortable that's in a good place, uh, but it does mean that that uh, expenditure won't occur in this financial year. So that's on the financials. Um, on our KPIs, these remain a work in progress. We went from 26 down to 5. Um, they probably still don't completely capture what we are trying to achieve as a business. There's a degree of work going into developing some of those measures. Um, and by end of the financial year, we expect to be able to provide uh, benchmarks on everything. Uh, in terms of performance against the targets, the one area I will flag today that we are forecasting we will come in behind on is uh, 
the bed nights target and related to that the uh, GDP, regional GDP target. Um, there are a couple of reasons for this. One is that the um, Pacifica Festival was cancelled right at the last moment uh, following the, the, um, the Christchurch um, event. Um, but also we made the decision during the year to move away from providing lump sum grants to the sporting franchises like the Blues and the Warriors and so on, where it was probably uh, a convenient way of garnering numbers for our KPIs where we would count their visitor nights and so on, but really the spend was irrelevant as to whether or not it affected whether or not the Warriors were attracting people to Auckland or not. So we've, we are taking a much more rigorous approach to how we spend money and how we measure results, but it does mean we'll be slightly behind uh, or sort of materially behind, I guess, um, in, on the visitor night's target. Um, looking forward, a couple of, sorry, risks. Uh, AC36, we highlighted this as a risk for the quarter, had the host venue agreement. That, of course, is now signed um, and has led to um, a much better um, uh, progress and momentum on the development of the event. A lot of stuff was being held up while that, that host venue agreement was being, being negotiated. So that risk uh, has been dealt with. And it sees a number of sensitive issues we managed in pursuit of significant screen production opportunities, and we covered that off um, yesterday. Uh, so really, we're not flagging any new major uh, risks at this point in time. Uh, looking forward, a couple of things. Um, the Future Ready Work Summit that's being held in Manukau next week at the Vodafone Events Centre. There's 200 to 250 to 300 people who have signed up for this. This is really about the future of work in Auckland, bringing together uh, some key leaders, and uh, we're looking to release a report on insights uh, in the impact of technology and change in, in Auckland. Uh, so that, ha that happens next week. Uh, there's a, a waiting list of people in, who are looking to attend that goes to the heart of our purpose around the focus on jobs as an organisation. And then the last one, I think the battery on this is seeing better. I'm going the wrong way, that's why. Future ready. And Elemental, again, we have uh, flagged this previously, but the festival kicks off beginning of July for a month, very much targeting winter, bed nights, our accommodation sector, um, Stakeholders are very supportive of this work um, and really looking to, to support a very vibrant Auckland over July, uh, focus on food, focus on music um, and supporting events right across the region, not just in the, in the CBD. And it's not doesn't say so here, but um, we ended up um, putting a lot more money into this because there was so much interest than we had initially planned to. So we had an overwhelming response from uh, 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 organisations and businesses in Auckland to be part of it. So that's uh, where we sit at the moment. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, happy to take. Um, it's, I suppose it's, it's some duty say, the court case, APTR. Uh, Possibly not, prefer not to, unless you want to ask questions on. Mark's just asking you about the uh, court case, the High Court case on the judicial review on APTR. We no. don't talk about that. It's not, and it's not something that we no. don't see ourselves as a party to that. No, but we don't talk about it around council. We are a party. Mark, is there anything you wish to say? All good. Just really that the board is um, working with the exec team at the moment to... Well, we've got a new chairman and we, we'll have a few new board members over the next few months. And so the, there's a genuine sort of like, I think, a, a rolling over of that strategy, looking at the strategy, looking at KPIs, looking at how we engage different groups through the, through the organisation slightly differently. And feel genuinely excited about the future, actually. Good. No. Nick, did you, did you mention to Kathleen, did you? As 
I was actually on holiday overseas and saw it in, in some newspaper things, so I'm just it's commenting on stuff that's been floating around. Oh, that's right, that's right. I'm just, I am just was wondered, uh, but you did mention Costco, and we know about that, so that's all good. Uh, Councillor Simpson. For an excellent presentation, I like presentations that answer all my questions, so I don't have to ask the questions. So I will just ask my famous question is, Nick, what's keeping you awake at night? What's the most concerning thing that's bothering you um, with, with regards to AT? Thanks. Well, the Chairman's just said we're excited and it's fantastic, the future's looking good, so, so nothing. But if I had to think really hard, um, look, we... we unfortunately had a resignation from Stuart Turner, who was head of major events, and for personal or family reasons, he's going back to Scotland. Um, he's been absolutely outstanding. Um, we have an arrangement with him that we, we will make the most of keeping him involved, but I am concerned that we will need to, to um, uh, very quickly provide the capability to support what, what um, Stuart has uh, achieved for AT. I think he has lifted the game in Auckland and we owe him a great debt. Okay. <clears throat> well, certainly Mark's got a very full head of hair. I don't think he's got any worries in the world at night. Sleeps very soundly. Um, we have Councillor Casey. Two questions, Nick. The first one, you mentioned climate change in your, in your report, but can you just give me some idea of what changes we can see with an AT in the next couple of months? I mean, what's the first thing we'll see you do? What's, what do you mean by um, look at um, opportunities in the green economy? What does that mean for us? What will we see? Um, there's probably uh, a couple of things to uh, talk about. I mean, I think that the, we did some work 12 months ago on the circular economy, and we see that that the insights from that are quite fundamental in thinking about what opportunities there are uh, in, in Auckland to support businesses that operate within the circular economy. So that thinking is being uh, brought to bear in how we look at businesses that we support. And so an example of that is working with the Sustainable Business Network, uh, looking to thinking about the America's Cup, the golf, the kinds of business opportunities that that may present. So we are working with Rachel Brown, seeing the America's Cup, the, the opportunity around the golf, um, and um, thinking about circular economy, what, what kinds of opportunities are there to promote, to promote those sorts of opportunities. So that's one, one area. A second area that... Um, uh, we're making a couple of appointments. One, in the destination area, we have a sustainability target and we're appointing somebody to, to lead work in the destination team um, to drive sustainability around tourism um, to Auckland. And we're also looking to make another appointment in sustainability that was working across the organisation to um, provide advice and measurement of the work that we do in terms of sustainability. So going back to the circular economy stuff, how can we build that uh, more significantly into the work that we do? Um, so just from the top of my head, those are a couple of the things that I am um, have been personally involved in and that we're, we are uh, um, pursuing. It's, it's fair to say from a board perspective that one of our cross-cutting themes is sustainability. And so what the board is looking for is a way of measuring those three cross-cutting themes along all the stuff, all, all, all the actions that we do. And so I don't think that we've got it yet, but we're talking to the executive team right now about how do we measure that? I mean, we had a joint board meeting with the, with the IMSB to talk about Maori outcomes and how to, how to measure that and how to be accountable for that as well. So, look, we just try to engage a little bit more. We, we'll, we'll learn a little bit more about how we do that, but we want measurement. We want... I, I want specifically AT to be a source of truth. You know, what, what are the facts? How can we measure things, not, not just sort of talk about things? And so that's something we're just working on. So, the, sorry, the three cost cross-cutting themes are one is sustainability, one is Māori outcomes, and the third one is spatially. So looking at what we do, how do we ensure we are addressing those across all the activities? Okay. Councillor Hills. 
Uh, yeah, first of all, congratulations. I think there's a whole lot of good work in here and a whole lot of other good work that you're not, um, that's not written down here as well. Um, you know, the focus is great. The tourism, Go With Tourism, um, was a fantastic and is a fantastic um, piece to bring it all together, the jobs, the tourism, the event side, the um, everything, and really targeting and having the faces of young people, young Aucklanders doing the work um, was really good and actually showing what is possible. I thought that was cool. Um, the issue around America's Cup, and I know you've only just um, signed the host agreement, but I, after meeting with some business associations last week, and thank you for um, sending some AT team to that meeting, um, and also a meeting with the Maunga Authority for Devonport will basically be, you know, a massive stadium of people. Um, I am a bit worried there's not, oh, and I'm sure it will happen, but a kind of coordinated, how is everyone going to mix together? And I know we're at the early stage, but I just want to put up if you need help or ideas or, or if we need to be, um, for the next council, putting a budget bit up for some of that work. I think there's an expectation from people that actually will be doing the work when lots of, say, fan zones, things like that, that's a Team New Zealand, that's not us, we can't actually do that, they've got the rights to those things. There's a bit of, bit more work to go, and it's probably just timing, but on how we can leverage, how we can get Auckland Transport working together. I think everyone kind of expects, oh, AT's just going to do everything for the city, but that may or may not be possible. So we just need to know what supports are needed, what local boards need to be putting behind it themselves, because they'll have some events budgets, but also what we can do as a council um, to support. Yeah, because it's just a bit confusing of how mm. it'll work on the ground, especially in places like Devonport, where you're going to have thousands of extra people standing on the Maunga watching. Um, and I think the Maunga Authority are a little bit yeah. unsure of how we can all help them to deal with those issues. So probably more flagging it rather than harder. Uh, I mean, I guess just respond by saying, first of all, uh, it's a hugely important piece of work um, that we are responsible for and that um, we recognise just how important that is for all the reasons that you've described. I think there is a whole question around how the event, the work around developing the event is sequenced and the, H, the delays on the HVA meant that a whole lot of stuff got held up because fundamentally Emirates Team New Zealand were distracted and weren't engaging on a whole lot of stuff that they have to make decisions on and we need to move forward together. So, you know, you talk about um, the rights that they hold and how things like fan zones and that might work. So that, that did delay that a bit, not in any way that's going to compromise, I think, where we get to, but just has delayed it. Um, but, you know, from now we are very much on, in, the, in the phase of, so what are these opportunities? How will this be coordinated? What does the council do? What does the government do? Uh, and also leading into the whole leverage and legacy piece around well, what will be left as a result of, of the America's Cup. So we're right now at the heart of, of you know, framing up those plans. Yeah, thank you. It's just that sort of, you know, our business, Devonport, for instance, they don't have the, they wouldn't even have the budget for extra portaloos and extra traffic management, let alone the fun, shiny stuff that they expect or hope will arrive, like did with Rugby World Cup or World Masters game. So there's probably some things we can take from that but yeah I guess just more certainty in the next six months for people would be good just on how we plan on a micro level around the city um, that would be awesome but thank you Councillor Walker I'll just um, raise something quickly and that is that as much and all as um, AT exists for dealing with business at a, at a big level um, what's happening across um, Auckland is a lot of local shopping complexes and the like are being hollowed out. Quite obviously, the entry of companies like Costco is going to exacerbate that. And while it's not possible for AT to get into that level of detail, I have raised issues around um, templating and so on, um, so that AT could provide some uh, facility so that um, local people, complexes, communities are better able to think through the problem and figure out how they can respond because the difficulty is that many of them are unable to do that. So I'm just raising that as an issue and I know you've got some people that work across the local as well as the, the top. Thank you.
Do you have a comment? We're, we're pretty sure that Kiwi Property and others are thinking about that as well. But uh... Uh, I mean, there's a number of levels you can respond. I think that this is a global challenge around the nature of retail and you know what a future town centres look like. We're certainly, I know I've had conversations with Penny Pirrit in the last six months about doing exactly what, what you suggest around are there some guidance, that, is there guidance that we can develop um, that's generic and can be picked up and certainly you know, I think that's something that has got merit. Um, but then there's more specific things and we are working for example right now with um, uh, Tamaki Regeneration and with Panuku uh, over the development of Gleninus and employment zones and where some of these things are much more acute and significant, we are certainly involved directly in exploring how you attract business investment and how that might then work within a, the development of that community. Councillor Filipina. I thought I was there. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, and, and, and also thank you uh, to, to AT and as, as one of the athletic councillors on this um, uh, on, on this committee, I just want to acknowledge um, the work that you've done around the sporting. Um, one, you got the test this weekend. Two, you've also secured uh, the games in August, uh, the rugby games. Three, you also uh, ended up getting um, the league series at the end of the year. So look. Um, I know that brings in um, what your policy and the events policy does. So, look, I just want to congratulate the, the board and, and yourself, Nick, in, in regard to that because, um, you know, it, it, it is tangible, but it's also around the destination Auckland and, and, and highlighting the Pacific because uh, there's definitely going to be a sea of red and uh, black. Um, I know where my money is, and that's on the Kiwis. So, um, yay. So, look, I, I just wanted to sort of put that out there and say thank you so much. And may that continue, by the way. Thank you. That's right. Uh, well, I'll follow up with a question now that you've brought up sports. So on the subject of sports, and it might be a sport that suits Councillor Filipina better, have you pursued, and RFA is here, have you pursued um, anything to do with e-sports? E I mean, are we ready for a first significant e-sports tournament? Um, look, I think the, the short answer is that's clearly where the world is going. Um, the, the, the one, I'm not sure whether, how much I can say, but you know, there have, are ideas around Formula E, and we have been doing quite a bit of work on that. And, uh, um, oh, sorry, uh, you said Formula E, you mean motorsports. I'm talking about... Video game. Yeah. Um, I couldn't talk about that. Oh, I know. That's what I was. I was. Yeah. I'm. I'm struggling to to <laughs> think of an answer. Um, well, esports. Uh, honestly, esports are the huge. I mean, yeah. I, I think probably the short answer is we. I, I couldn't share anything yeah. tangible with you uh, other than we recognise the nature of events is changing pretty fast. Um, that inevitably you're going to be, you know attracting those sorts of things, but I don't think I can point to anything that we've done at this point to to attract that here. I might be wrong, and further down in the organisation, they may well be having these conversations. I just haven't been party to them. Uh, Mark's just mentioned my ear about Sky City and their, the developments there in terms of bringing in digital entertainment opportunities, yeah. and we've well, certainly I'll, been working I'll, with them. I'll direct that. the question to RFA as well later. I mean, you know, tournaments been held where 60, 70, yeah. 80,000 people in the stadium, yeah. um, all watching teams and individuals compete on video games. And yeah. It's not my thing, but... There's possibly a gap that we need to um, pay more attention to. It, I think. Yeah. Just, just as a comment on, on, on sport, on looking at sports, we are, as a board, and with, with management, looking at sports which are... Um, or events which are eight years off at the moment. And the important thing about that is for Auckland is that once, if you can secure large events which are that far out, there's a lot of leverage you can get on the way through and a lot of things, particularly when, when they are aligned to our, to our core strategies and our core 
at our core themes in, in terms of um, sport and attraction events. So, you know, it's quite interesting to be looking that far out, but you have to, and you get a lot more value out of that as well. Thank you, team. Right. Good, to see, good to see you. Always good to see you.